Tonight, another day and a fuller view of just how close we came to a coup in this country. With new reporting about General Michael Flynn, I'm joined by Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, who stood up to pressure from his president and his party and death threats from complete strangers. Plus, COVID on the rise again. States see troubling new trends as more American cities suggest everyone gets booster shots. I talk one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Kizmekia Corbett, one of the driving forces behind the vaccine. And later, as Joe Biden meets with Xi Jinping of China, we look at two global players on a collision course. Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Every day, we learn a little bit more about how close we came to losing American democracy to Donald Trump and his inner circle. And today's revelations come from Betrayal, a new book on Trump's last minute attempts to cling to office from ABC News reporter Jonathan Carl. Carl reports that in the weeks after Trump lost the election, disgraced former National Security Advisor General Michael Flynn called up a former aide of his in the Pentagon, Ezra Cohen, and essentially asked him to get the military behind a coup. Flynn told him to cut his trip short and get back to the United States immediately because there were big things about to happen, Carl writes. Flynn told Cohen, we need you, and told a DOD official that there was going to be an epic showdown over the election results. Flynn, according to the book, urged Cohen that he needed to get orders signed, that ballots needed to be seized, and that extraordinary measures needed to be taken to stop Democrats from stealing the election. Now, Flynn has not yet responded publicly to these allegations, and NBC News has not yet verified these conversations from Jonathan Carl's book. But if his timeline is correct, this would have been just a week or two before the retired general went on right-wing TV and said this in mid-December 2020. He could order the, the um, in, within the swing states, if he wanted to, he could take military capabilities and he could place them in those states and basically rerun an election in each of those states. I mean, it's not unprecedented. I mean, these people out there talking about martial law, it's like it's something that we've never done. We've done, the martial law has been instituted 64, 60. Words cannot even express how berserk that all is. Ballots needed to be seized. Flynn told a top Pentagon official that he counted as an ally, according to Carl's book. What would you say if you saw all of this in another country? The, the defeated president's former top national security aide trying to get the armed forces to help steal ballots for an election that the president clearly lost. We would call it a military coup if it happened in a country like, I don't know, Turkey, which just happens to be another autocratic regime that Flynn happily lobbied on behalf of. And of course, if the general was indeed making frantic phone calls to get last year's election overturned, as is alleged, he wouldn't have been the only one. All I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state, and flipping the state is a great testament to our country. That was Donald J. Trump on January the 2nd calling Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, the Republican official who oversees that state's elections. That phone call is now the subject of a state criminal investigation. And for refusing Trump's request, Raffensperger personally suffered the president's wrath in interviews, at rallies, and on Twitter until Trump was suspended from social media. And the consequences were terrifying for the Raffensperger family, too. His wife said she got a text message this April saying, quote, you and your family will be killed very slowly. That threat, she said, had come a week after another anonymous text. Quote, we plan for the death of you and your family every day. It was chilling and overwhelming to Raffensperger, who told me before on this show that he was just trying to do his level best as a civil servant. Is it true that you and your family have been subjected to death threats too in recent days? Uh, yes, uh, specifically my wife has gotten uh, most of the threats. Uh, I guess they don't uh, send those directly to me, but my wife has gotten those, and uh, we received we forward those on to authorities. But it's uh, very upsetting, and it's, um, it's pretty disgusting when it's your own party doing that. It is pretty disgusting, and I'm so sorry to hear that's happening to you and your wife. Uh, you mentioned, you know, your own party doing that. 
I, I want to ask, we know who's doing it in terms of sending you threats, people who are angry about the idea of Donald Trump losing, but who's responsible for inciting that kind of disgusting behavior, to quote your description? Well, it's people that are uh, really spinning up the crowd and not even speaking truth. They're not speaking truth about the, the results. They're not speaking truth about the voting equipment. At the end of the day, you know, if I wanted to, I, I've been in the construction business for 40 years. I could use my what I call contractor language and you know and scream and holler and bellow and things like that. But I think nowadays, today, what we need are people that are just going to speak truth and and handle you know the situation and be civil to each other. Believe it or not, that interview was one year ago, November the seventeenth, twenty twenty. Now, Raffensperger faces a primary challenge from Republican Congressman Jody Heiss, whom Trump has endorsed and who tried to have Georgia's electors thrown out on the floor of the US House of Representatives on January the 6th. Raffensperger is answering his critics with a new book titled Integrity Counts. Much of the book goes deep into the timeline of the 60 days between election day and Trump's ominous phone call. Two months in which, as we now seem to be reminded every day with new revelations, how close we came to losing our democracy. The book also includes a full transcript of that notorious phone call, as well as Raffensperger's own personal story. Quote, I voted for President Trump and I am a lifelong conservative Republican with a proven voting record to match. But I could not do what he asked because the numbers just weren't there. Throughout the book, though, Raffensperger maintains that democracy and elections are under attack from both sides, Republican and Democrat. But is that really the case? Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger joins me now. He's the author of the new memoir and tell-all, Integrity Counts. Secretary Raffensperger, welcome back to the show. The recording of that infamous call is out there. You've been blunt in giving your side of the story before, including, as we just saw on this show. Why did you feel the need to write this book? Who is the target audience that you're aiming at, that you're trying to convince or persuade? This, I wrote the book, Integrity Counts, to set the record straight. So go point by point, everything that happened in the election, and I give people data points. And particularly on my side of the aisle, people can understand that 28,000 Georgians skipped the presidential ballot. They didn't vote for anyone, and yet they voted down ballot. David Perdue got 20,000 more votes in Metro Atlanta and Athens than President Trump. And the Republican congressmen got 33,000 more votes in their districts collectively than President Trump got. Look at those three data points. That explains why President Trump came up short for Georgia. So just on that Trump call, a lot of legal experts think Trump's greatest legal exposure is in Fulton County, where the district attorney has launched a criminal investigation into the former president's actions. You've said your office is cooperating with the DA, giving them requested documents. You've even said you'd gladly participate in an interview with them. Do you believe Trump is at risk there? And do the revelations in your book increase his legal, his criminal exposure? Well, as I say, I'm a licensed structural engineer. I'm not a lawyer, so I let the lawyers decide on that. I just uh, will cooperate uh, with a grand jury or other uh, people that would like to know exactly what we did. And we said we would comply. Uh, we will follow the law and we'll follow the Constitution. And we do that in all aspects of what we do in the Secretary of State's office. But, I mean, it's a nice line. I've heard you say elsewhere that you're not going to comment on the case because you're a structural engineer. Law is not your thing. You're also the Secretary of State. You comment on issues of legality and what the law says about elections all the time. It's part of your remit. So it is a kind of simple question. Was it legal, in your view, to call you up and ask you to find 11,000 votes? Could anyone else call your office and make that demand in that way without any legal consequences? Well, I don't know about that, but I'd certainly know that it uh, really was poor form. Really inter trying to interfere with what we were doing. We had our work to do. We had uh, several allegations of potential voter fraud. And so we were investigating every one of those. And we followed every one of those through to completion. Uh, there weren't thousands of dead people. There was less than five. There weren't any underage voters. Every single allegation, that's what I do in my book, is I give people the facts. Because there's lots of people that have been spun up by mistruths and falsehoods. And now I'm gonna give them the facts and that this will stand as a record copy of everything that happened. I also included my, 10 page, I have to... I included my 10 page letter to Congress. And to date, no one has disputed any of the facts that I gave Congress a year ago. And, and I'm, not, I'm not disputing the facts. You and I agree on the election. I'm asking you, you say poor form. 
But you as the Secretary of State of Georgia, when you got that call, when you put the call down, you write in your book, you were in the kitchen, you know, you had the phone, you may have gone and talked to a friend or your family member. You didn't think to yourself at the time, this is illegal, this could be illegal, what he just did. Really? Well, as I heard, I heard him trying to manipulate it into a, a position, trying to, you know, threaten us. But I knew that we had the facts and he didn't have the facts or his facts were all wrong. And so we weren't, we couldn't budge because we were following the law and following the Constitution. And it really destabilizes American had... society. When, when people create these stolen election claims and he lost fair and square in the state of Georgia. So he did. Donald Trump has called you disgusting, a complete disaster. Nobody can be this stupid. Sean Hannity spent an entire monologue slamming you as clueless. Your family have received ongoing death threats and abuse. I have to ask, why stay in this party that treats you so badly and is never going to forgive you for standing up to their cult leader? I'm a conservative because I believe in the principles of the Republican Party. I believe in economic opportunity. I believe in people that should have choices to really you know, decide what you want for your destiny for yourself and for your family. And so that's what I've always leaned into. Just because we have these momentary wins of people that don't really understand what it is truly to be a person that stands for freedom. We're the party you know, of Lincoln. We're the party of Ronald Reagan. So we have great, we have a great history. We have great values. But sometimes you have but people But you're now like, the party uh, of Trump. I'm the party of, I guess if you call me a, I'm a Reagan Republican. Because if you we look at what Ronald Reagan okay. did in the 80s, he got 49 of uh, states. He got the electoral votes for 49 I, I, I states. Understand. I understand. I understand the history. So that's a great leader. I'm just and wondering so how that's you. Something I respect. Well, because Reagan had. I understand the history. I'm just had, wondering how you. I just wondering how you square what you have been through and your family have been through with a party that treats you that way. I mean, but each to their own. Let I me know. ask you this, just to be clear. Just to be clear, is it fair to say? that there was no systematic voter fraud in the election in Georgia last year, that the election that you supervised as Secretary of State was free and fair? You are correct. There was no widespread voter fraud. So We have uh, ongoing cases. None of it adds up to anywhere near to 12,000. And that's what I talk in my book. So, I go so through he, every single data point. Yes. So here's what I don't get. If it was free and fair and there wasn't massive voter fraud, then why did so many Georgia Republicans use voter fraud to justify a new election law, SB 202, which passed on a straight party vote, which you have backed, even though it was heavily criticized. You've said there's no rational argument against some of its requirements. I don't get why you would pass a law to fight voter fraud if there isn't any voter fraud, how can you be supporting a law that's going after something that you say doesn't exist? Well, we actually increased the number of days of early voting. We have up to 19 days of early voting, which is better than New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. But we also incorporated for the first time using driver's license number with photo ID, something they've been using in Minnesota for 10 years. I believe that helps add a bit more objective measures to the absentee ballot process. And I think that'll give voters confidence. So those are two really solid measures. There's, when it's a big bill like that, you're not going to agree with everything. And I understand that. But on balance, it was very fair and also increased the number of days of early voting. With, with respect, uh, we can agree and disagree about some of the contents. You mentioned some of the good things in the bill that you think are in there. There are other things that, you know, there's less time to get absentee ballots. There's stricter requirements for it. People like yourself cannot send out absentee ballots to voters. That's criminalized now. Reduction in Dropbox. But what I'm really wondering is rather than we argue about the different things in the bill, the bill itself, let's be honest with each other and with our viewers, was pushed by a Georgia Republican party that said it's to fight voter fraud. And you told me a moment ago, there was no systematic voter fraud. So why pass a law to fight something that you say doesn't exist? I don't get it. In my book, I do quote uh, General Patton. He talks about moral courage is perhaps one of the most absent characteristic of man. And so really a lot of times people you know, are just fearful what would happen to them in a re-election or someone would primary them. But I've shown that I'm going to stand and I'm going to walk the line of integrity. I think we need more people that are going to do that, where you can go get another job, but you can never sell your integrity. So stand strong on integrity. People are looking for people that will stand up and be counted. And I've shown that I'll do that. I'll stand up and make sure we have fair but and honest elections in Georgia for everyone. 
With respect, Secretary Rathbone, I'm going to ask the question a third time. You just said to me there was no systematic voter fraud in Georgia, but you then supported a law that was pushed by Georgia Republicans who said this law is to tackle systematic voter fraud in Georgia. Please reconcile those two things for me. I believe that the bill uh, should help restore voter confidence, and that's a good thing. Because now we have to look at what Stacey Abrams talked about, voter suppression. And so we did some election reform measures. We, we've now introduced a, a ballot, a, a paper ballot, so we could do audits. And what, people had a ballot that they could actually hold instead of electronic voting. So that's one of the things that came out of the 2018 election, what Stacey Abrams talked about, voter suppression. So whenever we can really enhance the voter confidence, enhance security, but also accessibility, that is what you're looking for, is balancing that accessibility with security. And I believe with SB 202, we made a further improvement. I don't agree that I should have been okay. replaced as the chair of the state election board, but that's, some people could say that's just a personal uh, thing, but I think it's actually a, a wrong decision that eventually, along some point, will hurt the people of Georgia. A lot of people are worried about the state election board, the Republican legislature taking it over, you being demoted uh, as a non-voting member of that board. Pretty humiliating move by your party. And I guess if the idea was to restore voter confidence, maybe don't pass a law which is based on perpetuating lies about voter fraud that you don't agree with. But we're running out of time. I do want to bring up, you just mentioned Stacey Abrams. You played a major role in saving democracy this year, in standing up to Trump and the big lie, standing up to your own party. I don't think anyone would dispute that. But ever since your critics say you've been backpedaling, trying to both sides the threat to democracy. And in this book, almost every time you mention Donald Trump's election denialism, you equate it with Stacey Abrams not conceding in her 2018 governor's race. In fact, in a recent snarky tweet, you mocked Abrams saying, quote, congrats to the Braves on becoming World Series champs. Let's hope Stacey Abrams accepts the results. No mention of Trump there. No mention of the man who threatened you. Well, she's the one that like, cost us losing the All-Star game, and I thought it was very funny. And so I'm sure she has a great sense of humor like I do, and I'm sure she enjoyed that. But you can ask her that when you get her on your show next time. OK, but while you're here, let's talk about the comparisons you've been drawing between Trump and Abrams. Well, you say, in, as yeah. I say, again and again, you equate them, and you say the left and the right, the Democrats and the Republicans. Surely there is no serious comparison between what Stacey Abrams did and what Donald Trump did. Well, President Trump is a former president, and she's a wannabe future president. And I think we should hold people of the highest you know, office in our land to the highest ethical standards. So we're looking for character, integrity, honesty, trustworthiness, all those values. And that's what we should be looking for, really up and down the line, from water and sewer board all the way to the president. That's what America is looking for. We are looking for leadership. We are looking for honest leadership up and down the line. No, it's, it's 100 percent true. And a lot of people have praised Republicans who stood up to Trump. They praise Adam Kinzinger, Liz Cheney, yourself. The difference is Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney are very clear about where the threat to democracy comes from. It's the Republican Party. It's Trump supporters. They don't keep picking a random Democrat to equate with the Republicans. Your critics say that you, despite showing integrity a while ago, you're now so keen to get back with the Republican Party, so keen to win your election race, that you're just obsessed with going after Stacey Abrams. Even though Stacey Abrams, correct me if I'm wrong, Secretary Raffensperger, did not tell her supporters uh, the election not to vote because elections are rigged. She didn't tell, uh, she didn't threaten election officials. She didn't have her followers text officials like yourself death threats. She didn't incite a mob to attack the Georgia state capitol to try and overturn the 2018 election result. Surely you would agree she did none of those things. That's true. But also today I wrote an article in Wall Street Journal about the Steele dossier, how that was very dishonest and what that did. It undermined uh, and talked about Russian collusion. And so I think we need to just start having honesty on both sides. Our side, as a Republican, we need to hold our side accountable. Your side needs to hold your side accountable instead of this crosstalk each way. And so I think if we do that, we're going to start moving the I country mean, forward faster. <laughs> I'm not here to defend Stacey Abrams or be on party sides. I'm here to say that the former president of the United States incited an insurrection. His followers threatened you and your family. And you say he's the same as Stacey Abrams. I find that kind of offensive, especially when you're saying we should have people of decency and integrity in public life. Well, I say that we should hold everyone that they should really watch what they say in public. I think that when you had a show on just earlier, the one, uh, I think that we also all should always watch what we say, how we say it and um, make sure that we're civil. One of the things that when I was in the General Assembly, I had respectful conversations with my Democrat 
Democrat friends, and they were friends. Yes, we didn't agree on the policies, but we understood and we saw the humanity in each of us. And I think we need to do more of that in this country. Recognize that we're all Americans. We all want the same things. We just kind of are debating and arguing how we get there, but never deny the humanity of another human being. Here's the problem. Right now, you have actual Trump-supporting Republicans trying to overturn democracy. Some of them are running against you. Jody Heist, the pro-Trump, big lie-spreading Republican congressman, is now running against you for Secretary of State. Have a listen to some of the stuff he says. The narrative that President Trump incited riots on January 6th, I don't even understand, uh, Madam Chair, why you yourself don't speak the truth as to what President Trump actually stated and what he said. On the morning of January 6th, he said that I know that every one of you will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard today. It was Trump supporters who lost their lives that day, uh, not Trump supporters who were taking the lives of others. He literally objected to Georgia's electors on the floor of the US House on January the 6th. If he wins next year, and he's in office come 2024, and Trump makes the call to him that he made to you this past January, Jody Heiss will do what Trump wants, won't he? He'll find 11,000 votes. Surely that must worry you. Well, in my re-election campaign, I'm leaning, I'm leaning into the goodness of my average Georgian voters. Most Georgians are just great people, just like all over America. Great people, good values, and that's what I'm leaning into. Yes, there's a few people like Congressman Heiss. He's a double-minded person. He accepted the results of his You're race. You're not willing to things. say anything critical about Jody Heiss, a man who tried to overturn the election that you oversaw and is now trying to replace you. Well, he's a double-minded person, and at the end of the day, people are going to see through him. You've said for a year that you voted for Donald Trump in 2020. So if he, as looks likely, is the Republican candidate again in 2024, will you vote for him again? That is so far out in the future. There's so many people that are going to throw their hat in the ring. And I think we'll have a robust debate. And I believe that we'll have someone that will stand on character and have the moral compass to lead this nation. And if we don't, then we'll probably be out in the wilderness at least till 2028. So I'm with, looking forward and hopefully we have someone that does, that really can build the party. With the respect, because even if you look at, with the respect, at Secretary Raffensperger, we're, we're out of time and I have to ask the question again. You've done a masterful job of avoiding a lot of my questions. So I'm going to ask it again. If Donald Trump is a candidate, you told me at the start of the interview, you're a Republican, you're a conservative. Are you going to vote for this guy? That's so far in the future. I'm not, I haven't even thought about that. I got to get reelected next year. You're not ruling it out, which is astonishing to me. This is a guy who incited violence against you and your family and you're, not, and you're considering maybe voting for him. You're not saying tonight, no way am I ever voting for that guy. Was that a question or was that a statement? I didn't really understand. Uh, but what I'd I'll say ask, I'll, is... We're out of time, but I'll ask it one more time. Can you say emphatically tonight that you will not vote in 2024 for the man who you say threatened you, incited threats against you? I believe in 2024 will have a, a person that can grow the party because we didn't have 50% of the popular, popular vote for a long period of time. We need to grow our party. We need to figure out how to do that. So we have an attractive message that actually embraces people, expands the base, and we can make sure that we win with 50 plus 1% of the people plus win the Electoral College. Secretary of State Ra uh, Brad Raffensperger, we'll have to leave it there. Appreciate you taking time out. The book is Integrity Counts. Thank you so much. When we come back, what could be a major breakthrough in the treatment of COVID? We'll be joined by one of the nation's leading immunologists, the Federal Employee of the Year, who helped develop the COVID vaccine. We'll get her reaction to this latest COVID recovery and to what's happening on the pandemic front. We don't hear much from Dr. Kizmekia Corbett, but she'll join me live in 60 seconds. You do not want to miss this conversation. What if getting a milder case of COVID meant your doctor could call in a prescription for a pill that could protect you from serious symptoms of the disease, all while you recover at home? Sounds like a future game changer, doesn't it? And Pfizer says that future is now. This afternoon, the drug maker asked federal regulators to authorize its new experimental COVID pill, Paxlovid. If approved for emergency use, which could come as soon as Thursday, 
Yes, Thursday of this week, Paxlovid would be the first oral antiviral of its kind, an at-home treatment that could be prescribed to high-risk patients at the first sign of infection. Pfizer says Paxlovid cut the risk of hospitalization or death by almost 90%, a remarkable result. Before applying for emergency use here in the US, earlier in the day, Pfizer also announced a deal with a UN-backed group that will allow other manufacturers around the globe to produce the oral medication, a move that could make the treatment available to more than half the world's population, including in poorer parts of the world where vaccinations, of course, have lagged. You can see on this map the disparity of vaccine doses administered in Western countries versus countries in the developing world. More than 5 million lives have been lost to COVID globally, and that's a conservative estimate. 7.5 billion vaccine doses have been administered globally, but it hasn't been enough. In fact, it's barely scratching the surface in poorer countries where people have been hard hit by the virus. So will this help balance the scales, at least after infection? Here to talk about that and more is immunologist Dr. Kizmekia Corbett. As part of the coronavirus vaccine team at the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Corbett helped develop what became the Moderna vaccine. These days, she continues her groundbreaking vaccine research as part of the faculty at Harvard University School of Public Health. Thank you so much for joining me on the show tonight. You were one of the driving forces behind what became the Moderna vaccine. So first off, as a recipient of the Moderna vaccine, I just got my booster today. Thank you for that, much appreciated. How much have these COVID vaccines been a game changer, Dr. Corbett? Because on the one hand, they've massively cut down the risk of death and hospitalization, allowed people to do normalish things again. On the other hand, we're still in a pandemic. And yes, we still have breakthrough cases too. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on your show. It is quite a pleasure. Um, you know, vaccines across the board save lives. I like to say that tagline over and over again, and that is exactly what these vaccines are doing, albeit obviously distribution across the globe is lagging quite a bit. Um, and we are seeing some breakthrough infections, but overall the severity of disease and hospitalizations and deaths are significantly reduced in vaccinated people. And so of course it has been a game changer. Beyond allowing people to, re to resume normal activities, it gives people peace of mind that if they come in contact with the virus that causes COVID-19, that if they're vaccinated, they would fare better than if they were not vaccinated. Yeah. And of course, the holidays are quickly approaching and across the country we're seeing a rise in COVID cases. Again, six states have seen a 40% spike. Minnesota is seeing the worst of breakthrough cases. Hospitals are overwhelmed and according to the CDC, the state is nearing 9,000 deaths since the pandemic began. Minnesota had the worst seven-day case rate uh, in the country as of Sunday. Why are we seeing an increase not just in unvaccinated patients that we know about, but also breakthrough cases? When you have increased transmission, particularly when it's clustered in a particular area, for example, one state like Minnesota, um, you're going to see breakthrough cases, both in vaccinated people and obviously in unvaccinated people, you'll see a lot of cases. The one thing that is important to remember is that this is all based on the population and the amount of people that are vaccinated, the age of the population, how long ago they got vaccinated, and also, as people start to move in the fall and winter months, as we start to come into these holidays, Halloween just passed, you'll start to see an uptick for so-called surges in different places. And that is in so many ways, something that we expected. This is things that epidemiologists have been warning about since even the latter parts of the summer. And so it really means that everyone should, number one, get their first and second doses of the vaccines if you got the mRNA vaccines, for your first dose of the J&J &J vaccine. And then if you are in those really vulnerable populations, those populations that are elderly or immunocompromised, to ensure that you get your boosters so that you can remain adequately protected against severe disease. So let's talk about the COVID pill. What is your reaction to today's news from Pfizer about this pill? Could it be as big a game changer as the vaccines? Absolutely or you know, equally or more, depending on how you think about it, right? We have an entire world to protect and to ensure stays alive in the middle of a pandemic. So whether it be via vaccination or as the vaccines are lagging to getting to, the, to other corners of the world, via pills such as the Pfizer pill, 
that can really prevent people from getting severely ill, hospitalized, um, or, or dying from this virus. We have to make sure that we utilize all the tools in our toolbox. And so I'm very happy that these different companies are bringing on drugs that have this type of um, efficacy um, in clinical trials. Dr. Corbett, as a scientist, did you ever imagine that vaccines would become such a source of controversy, so politically polarizing, even more so in many ways than masks, which was crazy enough? Yes, actually, because before I was a scientist, I was a person that lived in rural North Carolina, and I understood what the education gap was oftentimes the knowledge gap when it comes to just really the nitty gritties of people's health. And a lot of times that is really the basis of what health disparities are. And also um, I am a black woman. And so I do understand how the medical institution has played a large role in um, having so much distrust among certain populations. And all of those things coming together with a brand new virus, um, new technologies, and a lot of language for people to understand on a very day in and day out basis. I certainly empathize with that. Um, what I will say is that it has opened my eyes to just how far we have to go as scientists, as educators, vaccinologists, and medical professionals to really start to inform people and continue to have conversations like we're having tonight on your show um, and, and also in the community. So on that note, you mentioned, you're right, it's not just Trump supporters or rural conservatives who are skeptical of the vaccine, people of color, especially black Americans who have had bad experiences with the healthcare system, have also been vaccine hesitant. Uh, I've seen Dr. Fauci, when he's asked about this, talk about your role in vaccine development. You're a black woman doctor who helped give the world a miraculous COVID vaccine. What do you personally say? I'm just curious to black friends or family members who are maybe hesitant about it, distrusting even. How do you make the case to them? Well, I don't say anything unless I'm asked, because I think what is my role um, and where I sit now is, you know, I have been in the lab since I was 16. So obviously my understanding is a little bit deeper and I can appreciate that than the, than the average person. And each one person has their own story. Each one person has their own inquiry about the vaccine. And so at this point, um, having been a vaccine developer and being a professor at Harvard and all of these things, it is my turn to simply listen. And I think that if we took that approach across the entire medical institution, we can certainly start to make some headway, and not just with Black people, um, to be clear, to with everyone, yes. right? Vaccine hesitancy or vaccine inquisitiveness, as I like to call it, really is just the um, boiling up so to speak, of a lot of people voicing their concerns that, they, that they've had for so long, whether it be about vaccines or their health in general. Last week, the House Select Committee, Dr. Corbett, the House Select Committee on the Coronavirus Crisis, released emails showing how the Trump administration pressured CDC officials to alter scientific guidance and COVID reports, prevented them from communicating directly with the public. You were a senior figure at NIH working under Dr. Fauci. Trump even came to see you. Did you ever feel any pressure from the administration, from the White House? Were you on the receiving end of these kind of censoring emails? Absolutely not. Um, and um, if anyone who knows me knows that I don't take well to pressure anyway, I really am here to do the science and um, to do the science well and to really stand in this place where I hope that the public can start to trust science and medicine again, really. And so, no, no pressure at all. The only pressure that I felt was for myself to get the job done well and to do it really quickly so that we could be here right now where we have multiple vaccines that are authorized um, for use um, in this country and around the globe. You certainly did that job well. And yet on the global situation and in, in terms of global inequity, when you see how under-vaccinated, say, Africa is compared to Europe or North America. That's a moral travesty. That's a scandal, is it not? And it's self-defeating, too. We have to get the whole world vaccinated, do we not, if we are going to beat a global pandemic? You are absolutely right. Um, um, we certainly have to get every single person at least having the ability to choose whether they want to be vaccinated or not. That is where I stand. 
And I think that um, we are certainly a long way from that, but I'd like to sometimes look at the bright side. Whereas in normal times, um, prior to this moment where we've come upon these revolutionary technologies, where we've come upon global collaboration, and we really have these types of technologies that we can deploy across the world, we'd be in a certainly different stance two years into a pandemic and perhaps without a vaccine to talk about it all. And so um, while we do have a long way to go, we certainly have come far. In order for this pandemic to get under our belt and to go into what we call the endemic phase. This is where we aren't seeing large amounts of deaths from this virus. This is where we really are li living in what we call an equilibrium with this virus. We're certainly yep. going to have to vaccinate all over the world, and we're going to have to start to take a lot of other public health precautions like testing on mass scale and et cetera. So last question, you mentioned endemic. People talk about the new normal. Is this it? Are we in it? Is this pandemic ever going to be over or is COVID with us forever? It's endemic. COVID, I think, and I, I actually called this, a, a, I think probably even around maybe April or something of last year, where we have allowed this virus to transmit around the world. Um, and so much um, has happened and the virus is basically here with us today. Um, no telling where the virus is in animal reservoirs and et cetera. So we're gonna to get to the point, just like we are with our typical flu season, where people, a lot of people might get the sniffles. There will be, unfortunately, some people, particularly in vulnerable populations that will die every year, but at least with mass vaccination and a complete understanding of the science of this virus, and also a general public's understanding of how to deal with their infections, whether it be with a pill or otherwise, we can get to the point where we can live with the virus um, in the endemic or seasonal state, so to speak. Dr. Kizmekia Corbett, uh, so many more questions for you, but we're out of time. Appreciate you taking time out to speak with us this evening. Thank you so much. Up next, before the election, Republicans were apoplectic about critical race theory. Where is all of that outrage gone? That story is next in 60 seconds. Don't go away. I know that trying to think about what happened in the before times seems near impossible these days, but all the way back in October of 2018, Donald Trump and Fox News became fixated on a single issue that magically, suddenly, inexplicably began to consume them only weeks before the midterm elections. Imagine that. I think two words are going to define the 2018 election in the next three weeks. One is Kavanaugh and the other is caravan. This could be the election of the caravan. 19 days before the election, not good timing for Democrats. Another migrant caravan from Central America making its way to our southern border. Yet another caravan is forming. Migrants from the caravan moving through Guatemala. A massive caravan barreling toward the U.S. border. A foreign country attempts a kind of invasion. It's just not this one caravan we're talking about. I mean, in terms of size, caravans like this are coming across the border all day, every day. Ah, yes the migrant caravan that was supposedly coming to invade our suburbs and our churches. Whatever happened to that? I'm sure you won't be shocked to learn that the caravan was merely a tool used to whip up the GOP base to whip up Fox viewers, a cynical ploy to exploit racial fears and get out the vote. Not that the caravan didn't exist, but the malintent projected upon it was certainly fake. Fox News got so lathered up over the whole thing that even SNL got in on the fun. A vicious caravan of dozens, maybe millions, of illegal immigrants is headed straight for you and your grandchildren. And that is not fear-mongering, that is just... The truth. And then, as soon as the election was over and the evil caravan had served its purpose, Fox and their GOP friends almost immediately stopped talking about it. And don't just take my word for it. According to the Associated Press, quote, within the West Wing of the Trump White House, there was a sense that the caravan was a useful midterm messaging tool, an 11th hour pre-election strategy. But once the election was over, the president's attention turned elsewhere, according to officials and advisers. 
Is this ringing any bells? A fake, racially charged issue that crops up right before an election and then disappears after the votes have been cast and counted. Sean Hannity, what have our 2021 voters won? Parents and common sense Americans are pushing back against the destructive far left critical race theory ideology. The idea of critical race theory. Critical race theory. One group of parents in Loudoun County, Virginia, right outside Washington, is fighting back against all of this. Loudoun County last night. In Loudoun County, Virginia, banning teaching of critical race theory. Racist critical race theory. And McAuliffe saw nothing wrong with Loudoun County. This was a referendum on Biden and on the progressive movement and on CRT. That's right, in the weeks leading up to the Virginia election, on Fox, it was all critical race theory almost all of the time. They were obsessed. But surprise, just a week after the ballots were cast, as the Washington Post's Philip Bump points out, mentions of CRT were way down on Rupert Murdoch's TV network. Way, way down. Are you seeing the pattern here? There's always a caravan or a critical race theory panic to be had. There's always a black or brown boogeyman to point to. And it's always just before a crucial election. And then suddenly, conveniently, it's gone. So I dread to think what controversy the right will manufacture for us, which non-white group they'll obsess over a year from now for the midterms. But they will. And there's that old saying that George W. Bush once butchered, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice. Shame on me. I don't know what happens if you get fooled three times, but let's try not to find out, shall we? When we come back, a pivot to China. If there's one way to describe the US-China relationship, it's complicated. So how did two world superpowers have a first date in this day and age? Presidents Joe Biden and Xi Jinping sat down for a much-anticipated virtual summit to talk through some of their issues. As I've said before, it seems to me our responsibility as leaders of China and the United States is to ensure that the competition between our countries does not veer into conflict, whether intended or unintended. Just simple, straightforward competition. China and the United States should respect each other, coexist in peace, and pursue win-win cooperation. I stand ready to work with you, Mr. President, to build consensus, take active steps, and move China-US relations forward in a positive direction. These things can be so dry, the readout said, the three-and-a-half-hour meeting was respectful and straightforward. But there's what appears on camera, and then there's what goes on behind the scenes. Biden has said clearly he's no friend of President Xi and wrote in a foreign affairs piece last year, the United States does need to get tough with China. If China has its way, it will keep robbing the United States and American companies. And he talked about building a united front to confront China. Then, in his first major foreign policy speech, he doubled down on wanting to get tough on Beijing. We'll also take on directly the challenges posed by our prosperity, security, and democratic values by our most serious competitor, China. But for Republicans, none of these remarks from the president matter. It's a strategic GOP talking point to paint Biden as being soft on China. The National Republican Senatorial Committee sent a 57-page memo last year that urged GOP candidates to call China an enemy and blame Democrats for being, quote, soft on China. People like GOP Senator Ted Cruz have followed the playbook, just like fellow China hawk Marco Rubio, who asked Biden to fire former Secretary of State and current climate envoy John Kerry for being ethically challenged on China. Rubio even told Biden to block TikTok. The Chinese governments have sanctioned the two GOP senators, and they're not bothered by it. I wear China's sanction as a badge of honor. There's a reason they're lashing out. There's a reason they have decided to direct personal sanctions on me because they are scared, they are terrified. China being terrified of Ted Cruz? What a thought. I do wonder, though, where were these GOP senators when their party leader was heaping praise on Xi Jinping, calling the Chinese president his friend at every chance he got? We have developed a friendship, I can see that. And I think long term, we're going to have a very, very 
great relationship, and I look very much forward to it. Trump said it multiple times that she was his friend. All that praise did come in handy for something, I guess. To be fair, aside from his rhetoric, Trump was at times, quote, tough on China through his trade war and sanctions. And for all their differences, Biden's China policy has been a lot like Trump's. He's even kept the China tariffs in place. So yeah, it's a tricky relationship. Whoever is leading the US will inevitably be competing with Xi. But the US has to work with China as well on things like climate change and trade, while also standing up for serious concerns in places like Xinjiang with the Uyghurs, as well as Hong Kong and Taiwan. So exactly how should Biden navigate this complicated relationship? And what's the US perhaps missing in its approach towards this new superpower in the East? Joining me to help answer some of these questions is Kaiser Kuo, a rock star turned China expert. He's the host and co-founder of the Seneca podcast, which has been following current affairs in China since 2010. Kaiser is also editor at large of the news site SUP China. Thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Kaiser, there were no fireworks after President Biden and Xi's virtual meeting last night. No reports of the kind of heated exchanges we saw at the US-China-Alaska summit back in March. Do you get the sense something good has come out of this meeting? This is a difficult relationship to manage. Well, yeah, I mean, considering the state of things between the US and China, really since the onset of the trade war back in 2018, uh, it's hard. I mean, and, and, and given, as you were just saying, uh, how the Biden administration has largely continued the Trump policy, Trump with allies, as some people have described it, it's hard not to be, you know, a little happy about uh, how the temperature is has clearly come down a little bit. Uh, it's hard not to be cheered by this meeting. It was a whole lot better than Anchorage. Right? There's no gratuitous grandstanding. Uh, there, I think there were important signals, and I think uh, from each side. And it's not a thaw. It's not a new beginning. It's not a reset. But I think it may at least arrest the pretty precipitous downward slide that we've seen. Yes, but in the meeting last night, Biden did say that all countries have to play by the same rules of the road, uh, following a rules-based order. That's a favorite theme of the Biden administration, especially vis-a-vis -vis China. Anthony Blinken mentioned it in Alaska. Putting aside whose rules are right and whose are wrong, China seems to operate within its own set of rules. Is that fair to say that the two countries fundamentally disagree on how they should be operating on the world stage? I think a friend of mine said it well when he described China as having cheated at a rigged game. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, China does seem to operate by its own set of rules, but that's a set of rules that was, uh, you know, created by uh, a group of, of wealthy countries in the post-war period. And uh, I think, you know, China is is not a, a status quo power exactly. I think it's it's been... But no, neither has it completely sought to overturn that, that global rules-based order. I think the Chinese leadership is is very cognizant of the extent to which it's benefited from it. It probably has benefited more than any other country from the existence of that rules-based order. And uh, no, I don't think they're in a hurry to completely overturn it. That's been greatly exaggerated. The US might be planning a diplomatic boycott of the Winter Olympics in Beijing in February in protest at China's human rights record, especially with the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. That would be quite the posture, would it not? Yeah, I mean, if you read that piece by Josh Rogan, who, you know, is routinely used as sort of a mouthpiece by hawkish people in, in China, uh, I, I think that there's no, nothing new in there at all. Uh, this idea of a diplomatic boycott, the idea that uh, U.S. officials will not attend, uh, that has been, you know, common knowledge for a long time. That was that piece was timed, obviously, to try to throw some cold water on the summit. What was interesting during this this meeting was that she, you know, there had been rumors that he was going to actually invite Biden to the Winter Games in Beijing, he didn't do that, or at least we don't know about it either, you know, none of the public remarks or none of the readouts included mention of that. I think that was wise on Xi's part not to have done that and placed Biden in that awkward position where he would have either had to accept or decline. So uh, that, that, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think knowing, a, a well, lot of Biden was in I was just saying, knowing That's Biden, he might have just accepted spur of the moment and then have to walk <laughs> it back later. Um, yesterday, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said he's going to add a China-related bill to the massive defense policy bill, the NDAA, this week. It's supposed to add $190 billion to strengthen U.S. technology and research, another $54 billion towards semiconductors and telecommunications-related equipment. It'll likely pass. Biden pegged his recently passed infrastructure bill as something that would make the U.S. more competitive with China. 
I just wonder, is China taking similar actions? We hear so much about China being America's biggest rival. We're doing all this funding, all this spending, all this investing with one eye on Beijing. Is, is it being reciprocated? Well, it's always been sort of a, a New York-Chicago relationship uh, where, you know, <laughs> China as second fiddle has always sort of obsessed on everything that the United States has done. So this is not new to China it would be new to the United States. Uh, I mean, I think as a good friend of mine, Ryan Haas, who used to be the China director of the National Security Council during the Obama administration, he said that uh, China has become the policy equivalent of duct tape. If you need to give NATO a purpose, talk about China. If you need bipartisan cooperation on infrastructure, talk about China. Uh, so yeah, I mean, they're going to be using it, as he suggested, to sell babies diapers pretty soon. Uh, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> become kind of hard. Uh, it's, a, but, uh, it's yeah. an apt analogy. Um, let's talk about, you said bipartisan. So you have a bunch of Republican hawks uh, in Congress. What do you make of people like Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley and Marco Rubio and some of their rhetoric, uh, their willingness to go along with Trump's pretty xenophobic, sinophobic, you know, China virus stuff during the pandemic and just generally making lots of hawkish noises about things like Taiwan and beyond? Yeah, I, I think these guys have blood on their hands, the blood of, of Asian Americans who have you know, seen a massive uptick in violence in the United States uh, ever since Trump started using that kind of rhetoric. And as you say, I've seen it echoed. Uh, they went into it believing that this was done with no cost. I mean, you know, they know how politically potent this stuff is going after China and how, you know, in their thinking, unlike with immigrants or LGBTQ people or Muslims, uh, they they don't need to use dog whistles. They can come straight out and, and say the ra straight out racist stuff because there was no political cost to it at all. There was some, you know, there were enough weapons available that you could animate anyone who had a, a, a chip on their shoulder with, with respect to China. Uh, I mean, whether it was the human rights community and people on yes. the far, they made some very, very strange bedfellows, but no one was going to censure them. So it cost them nothing. Uh, there was no, not even a powerful pro-China business lobby like there used to be, you know, that's been effectively neutered, you know, thanks in large part to China's own behavior, certainly, that hasn't been helpful in that regard. Uh, and, you know, it plays well with the conservative base. They see it as a vulnerable flank uh, of Biden. And yeah, they, they've gone for it. They started, you know, howling about it immediately. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, it's not just Cruz and and and, uh, and, and Rubio, it's Holly and it's Cotton and it's just about every other uh, really sort of hardcore and, right wing. And i got to ask about uh, Taiwan. China spent the last couple of decades building a very modern military in large part to intimidate Taiwan. Um, it now has the largest navy in the world. Earlier this week, it conducted training and night bombing drills in the South China Sea. Biden was asked today if there was any progress on the subject of Taiwan in his meeting with Xi. And he said, we made very clear we support the Taiwan Act. And that's it. Uh, it is independent. Taiwan is independent. It makes its own decisions. Where is this Cold War over Taiwan headed? Well, actually, Biden used language that she really wanted to hear. He said that the U.S. resolutely opposes efforts by either side, by Taiwan or by the PRC, to change the status quo. Uh, that is ambiguous enough so that Biden can turn to his critics in Congress and say, well, obviously, it's Beijing that's been trying to change the status quo. Uh, but, you know, Xi Jinping can take that, that readout and, and say, well, look, uh, obviously, it's Taipei, it's Tsai Ing-wen who's been trying to change the status quo. So we agree. Uh, which is fine. I mean, ambiguity is really what we need to do here. Uh, the Chinese readout Kaiser, actually. Yeah, I, I'm going to jump in because we got 30 seconds left. I want to get your last take very quickly. We often talk about China in a very superficial, reactive way. I include myself in the U.S. media is not very good at covering China. What are we missing? What's the big thing we're missing? 30 seconds. Cognitive empathy. We need to be able to put ourselves inside China's head to really see what the world looks like. Regular world empathy works fine when you're talking to people who share your history, your, your lived experience, your values, your religious beliefs. But when you're trying to understand how other people, you know, how other messages fall on them. Let's take human rights, for example, on Xinjiang. There are plenty of Chinese people who would have a great deal of sympathy for the plight of the Uyghurs who are suffering terribly in mass extra-legal internment in Xinjiang. But they, they believe that it is weaponized, and you need to understand why they would believe that the discourse on human rights has been completely weaponized. And uh, it, it doesn't work when that, you do it this way. It's a, it's a very good point, empathy and understanding. Kaiser Kuo, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Fascinating conversation. Appreciate it. That does it for me tonight. Make sure to join us on Instagram. 
Twitter, TikTok and Facebook. And I'll see you back here as ever tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern live right here on The Choice from MSNBC. For now, from me, good night. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.